Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to talk briefly about the, pro the trials and tribulations of putting a new gun design into production. The fact of the matter is, it's really hard, it takes a long time, and I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate that. So let's start with, uh, I would assert that in order to put a new firearm into production will take typically between 5 and 10 years of development time. Now, there are obviously exceptions. Um, the Sten gun, the PTRD anti-tank rifle are two particularly notable exceptions of guns that went into production very quickly. However, uh, those are also extremely simple guns. Uh, when we're talking about things that are intended to be uh, high quality, you know, large production guns, it just takes a lot longer to do it. So the first issue is the jump from a handmade proof-of-concept prototype sort of gun to an actual production line assembly is massive. And that's something I think a lot of people certainly don't really understand the magnitude of. The thing is, with a prototype, it's, it's like one gun with multiple people working on it uh, for an extended period of time, and you don't have to figure out exactly what the tolerances are on the parts in order to make a single example of the gun work. You hand fit it, and when it, if something doesn't quite work right, you tweak the one or two parts involved until it does work right. Presto, you're done. And that's why you can have uh, trials examples of rifles do phenomenally well in, say, reliability endurance testing, and then production versions of the gun fall flat on their face. It's because, well, when you go to mass production, now basically you don't get to put a person's hands on the individual parts at all in the process. You're making hundreds or thousands of individual parts at a time, they all go into bins, and then you take one of each part from the bin and put together a gun, and hope that it works, because at that point you've already put in all the time to develop the tooling. So let's keep in mind, the way actual parts are made for things, and have been for quite some time, is that you have a series of jigs and fixtures on cutting machines. And the idea is you put a piece of material into this fixture, and you hit a button on the machine, and it will make a certain profile of cut on the part. So the way guns used to be made before CNC was typically huge lines of machines, and each machine did like one cut. And if you had a, a fancy curved surface, well, you'd have a custom-made cutter that would cut that fancy curved surface in basically one axis on one machine. And then you take that part and you move it to the next machine to cut a different surface. So first off, in the production series, you have to have your, your tooling set up so that the part is held exactly correctly in the machine, and the cutter is taking exactly the right amount of material, or is taking exactly the amount of material that you intend it to. Because you may not know exactly how much it has to, you know, how deep does that cut have to be? you won't know at the very beginning, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but then you've got a whole, like every cut is a separate machine. Today with CNC we can do use one machine to do a bunch of cuts uh, one after another, which makes the whole process vastly more efficient and faster. But it doesn't fundamentally change the fact that you're making one cut at a time, and it's got to be just right. Now let's say you get the part out of that machine, and something's not quite right. Well, let's say which is to say, you put it in the gun and the gun doesn't work. The first thing you have to do is figure out why isn't the gun working. And there can be some really counterintuitive, very difficult to, to figure out uh, rationales for things not going right in guns. Um, the L85 is a good example of this. Uh, you had things like uh, little bits of brass being shaved off the cartridge cases because of overly sharp surfaces in the feedway. But the actual the symptom that was being seen was the gun's not cycling reliably. And so would, how do you, it, it's a significant investigatory process to work backwards from the gun doesn't cycle to, ah, we are occasionally getting a little bit of brass stuck in, say, the locking lugs, and it may not be there after we clear the malfunction. So you can't assume that just because someone knows what all the parts are that go into the gun, they automatically will understand intuitively every potent the, the reason for every potential malfunction. 
Um, there are, like, gun design is littered with mystery malfunctions that take time to try and figure out, and often a lot of trial and error. Um, the mysterious seventh round stoppage on the M1 Garand is a, a good example. During development, the guns developed a habit of not cycling on the seventh round in the clip. Why the seventh one? That's the question. That's the sort of thing that takes a lot of time to develop. Now, fundamentally, once you figure all this stuff out, what you'll end up with is a tolerant zone for every dimension on every part. And that is to say, if the, the dimension is supposed to be one inch, it will work from some you know, 9.5 to or 0.95 to 1.05, hypothetically. But you have to figure out what that boundary zone is. It will be different between different parts. Some parts have more tolerance for interacting with others, some have less. You will have parts where sometimes the minimum tolerance is, or the, the amount that you can be below average is different than the amount above. So it's not 0.95 to 1.05, maybe it's 1.0 to 1.05, or the other way around. And this is the, the process that you don't really have to do in a handmade prototype. You don't have to figure this out, because you're just making one gun work, and once you've got all the parts within those ranges, you may not know what the ranges are, but once the gun works, all the parts are in the right range, and that example is good. Now to turn that into a production line thing, you've got to figure out what are all of the ranges for every dimension on every part. You then have to also be able to set up your manufacturing equipment to cut parts within those tolerances. If you have a fixture that doesn't hold a part steadily enough, the part has just a little bit of vibration to it, that's going to dramatically expand the uh, the, the variation in a particular dimension or dimensions that are being cut on that part. At the same time, you also don't want things necessarily to be too perfect, because let's say you have a part that works fine with a 10% variation in the dimension. Well, if you're putting in the time and effort to cut it within 1%, but you don't need to, you are wasting time and efficiency where it's not necessary. On a commercial enterprise this is relevant because it cuts into the profit margin, or correspondingly increases the final price of the gun. From a military perspective, say in wartime, every, every minute or hour that you spend making a gun more perfect than it needs to be is that many fewer guns that you can make in a given time frame. This is why nations go to these sort of last ditch simplified styles of guns, is just so that they can make more with less. Um, where we see problems are when people attempt to release guns onto the market or into the military without having sufficiently done that process. And I contend that that process of figuring out all of these interrelated dimensional restrictions on a gun, which is going to have dozens if not over a hundred individual parts, that is a five to ten year process to do. And that hasn't really changed much with the advent of CNC. Um, CAD CAM software um, certainly has helped it, but this is still a labor-intensive, time-intensive process, and it's compounded by the fact that you will never be able to predict and test everything. There are always going to be issues that show up in the field. Once you've got a thousand or ten thousand guns produced, something's going to come up that you didn't anticipate. So. Uh, a few examples of guns that we think of today as supremely reliable, but actually took five or ten years to get right? Well, the one that comes to mind right off the bat is the AK. The AK was originally developed with a stamped sheet metal receiver. That's the Type 1. I have a video on it, I'll link to it at the end of this video. The Type 1 didn't work. There was They had so much trouble getting those stamped receivers to be within tolerance, within the acceptable dimensions, um, because the Soviet Union hadn't done, in guns, uh, finely crafted stamping. They'd done simple, like more like bent sheet metal uh, guns, like the Papa Shaw 41 and the uh, PPS 43, but they hadn't done things kind of on the level of detail that, say, the Germans did. And by the way, Germany, they had a huge reject rate on Sturmgewehr MP43, Sturmgewehr 44 receivers. Like, those were not just because Germany was able to pull off that gun doesn't mean that they did it perfectly. They threw out a ton of scrap receiver stampings in the process of making them. But they're in the middle of the war, and they don't have the time 
to be able to slow down the process, fix the process, reduce the scrap rate, and then put them back into production, because they need the guns right now. So they just accepted a high scrap rate and produced them anyway. The Soviet Union looked at this massive scrap rate on uh, AK receivers and went, this isn't viable, we have to fix this. And it took them years to do it, and in the interim they went to just a simple giant steel block of a milled receiver. That was not the original intention of the gun, and it wouldn't be until the introduction of the AKM that they were finally able to get that sorted out and, and, man, and manufacturable. So you think of the AK as, oh it's super simple, it's easy, third world countries can manufacture them. Well that's not really the case. There was a tremendous amount of engineering effort and time that went into actually getting that. Now once you've figured it all out it gets a lot easier to replicate it later on, and that's why we see the AK technical package being distributed to a bunch of other countries, and those countries being able to manufacture them much more quickly and easily than the original Soviet development time. Um, when it comes to like counterintuitive or difficult to predict things, we can look no further than the AR-15. The change uh, in powder types led to a change in chamber pressure, a change in pressure curve, I'm sorry, it didn't lead to a change in chamber pressure, it led to a change in port pressure. Uh, which led to a change in the gas pressure going back into the action, which led to an increase in the velocity of the bolt travelling rearward, which led to a change in the rate of fire. The gun fouled more because it had different powder in it. It was cycling faster than it was intended to, you had parts damage, you had unreliability. All of this originally due to a change in powder type that didn't affect chamber pressure. So how do you take that and, and figure out the root cause. It takes time, and it's the sort of thing that can't always happen at the factory. So when people think about why don't we just build X, um, as well as why isn't, like, new gun X is 5% better than the M16 in these prototype initial trials, so we should obviously adopt it, like, now. Well the problem is, Prototype Gun X is going to have some teething issues. There are going to be problems that are going to be found if it goes into major production and service. It will take time to get it into production, and it may not end up being as any improvement over the current rifle once it actually gets through production. So um, this of course also applies to reproductions. People say, well, you know, the Sturmgewehrs. Germany managed to make Sturmgewehrs. 75 years ago, why can't someone make a reproduction now? Well, the technical data package is basically gone, uh, and someone's going to have to recreate it from scratch, which means they have to figure out all of those dimensions and tolerances on their own, and we've seen people try it and nobody's really managed to pull it off. Um, the, the example I love using is SMG's reproduction FG42, which by the way now has been in development and manufacture like twice as long as the original FG42 was in Germany. And that's why that gun works now as a reproduction, because Rick Smith has put essentially 10 years plus into that, that gun. That's what it takes. Uh, so uh, I didn't intend that to turn into a rant. Oh, maybe that's a bit of a rant, maybe not. But uh, hopefully this can bring a little light to why things aren't as simple as, well we have a CNC and we just push the button and it spits out a working gun, because there really is a lot more to it than that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this, thanks for watching.